So remember those follow-up videos about vegan gains I've been promising? This is a world, this is a world premiere. This is a world. So this week I'm gonna spend a little bit more time getting specific about criticisms I made about vegan gains, AKA Richard Burgess. Now I'm not here to trash anyone, I'm just here to clarify some questions I've been getting from viewers on this channel. This isn't so much a response video as an exploration where I failed to go deep enough in my previous video. And I'm gonna spend this video correcting some things where I think I might've been misunderstood by Richard in particular. And then later in the week, I'm gonna look at his take on Black Lives Matter. Then I'm gonna be looking at Richard's take on Islam. And then next week I'm gonna address why I suggested that Richard might be aligning himself with a movement for ethno-nationalism and even unintentionally so. And no, I'm not gonna be talking about Richard every day. We're gonna do some updates on the projects I've been working on and some news updates. You know, stuff I like to do with you. First, I'm gonna remind you all how we got here. So I made a video questioning Vegan Gaines on how his often violently charged, sometimes misogynistic, and generally hostile approach was helpful for veganism. So Vegan Gaines, I don't wanna be a hypocrite and challenge your way of doing animal rights advocacy or vegan advocacy because the animals aren't free and no one has shown a surefire way to set them free. But I do wonder how you think what you're doing is helping the animals. Okay, so right now he's just setting the stage for his whole argument, which is, you're a bad person and you should feel guilty. So right away, as you can see, Richard has taken the question as an attack, which I guess is a reasonable response. I wouldn't call it the most rational way of responding to a question. It's certainly not the only way to take that question. Well, tell me, what the hell does anything I have to say about women have to do with veganism? What does the ethical implications of needlessly causing the suffering and death of animals have to do with me calling a girl a bitch? What does me proving that animal products cause heart disease have to do with my dying grandfather? What does the environmental impacts of animal agriculture have to do with me making a joke about how I hate children? The answer is nothing. None of these things are fucking related. How I treat family members, how I treat women, how I hate children, it has nothing to do with veganism. I couldn't agree with you more, Richard. In my opinion, they don't connect at all to veganism, which is why I don't understand why you tend to use this approach. I mean, it's pretty emotionally driven, and since you've disparaged the use of emotion in my video, only you seem to be appealing to hate and anger and outrage, where I tend to appeal to people's kindness, generosity, and sympathy. It seems like two variations on the same approach. And so it seems like you might be contradicting yourself here. You've probably heard the term intersectional activism or intersectional social justice. It's the concept that all forms of oppression intersect and all come from one source. Now here, Richard offers a definition for intersectionality. I've made several videos responding to similar attempts to define this term. So this time I'm gonna let distinguished law professor Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, who coined the term, define it for themselves. Many years ago, I began to use the term intersectionality to deal with the fact that many of our social justice problems like racism and sexism are often overlapping, creating multiple levels of social injustice. Now, words in their general use can shift in their meanings and become confusing. Dr. Crenshaw talks about this issue as well on a recent interview on The Laura Flanders Show. So there's some visions of intersectionality that just um, portray it as it's complicated. It's sort of the, you know, well, it's intersectional, you know. So basically it means um, no, no one explanation tells you anything, that, everything you need to know. But um, a lot of times that's just the end of the conversation. Um, I think the second thing that I've seen is the idea that intersectionality is basically identity politics on steroids. So first you have the negativity associated with addressing the politics of identity being reduced to a term 
identity politics mm -hmm. that now functions kind of like political correctness. Mm -hmm. It's the thing that you don't want to be. Um, and then you throw intersectionality in it, so it takes everything that's bad about identity politics and then, you know, complicates it by a factor of a thousand. Those aren't really the most productive ways of thinking about intersectionality you know at the saying. moment. Now, regardless of how confusing the word might be, this shouldn't stop someone as committed to facts as vegan gains from doing the work to define these terms clearly. Although you preach ethics, at least as far as animals are concerned, you also seem to exemplify a level of toxic masculinity that I think might be turning a lot of people off to your message. Uh, toxic masculinity. So let me explain what this really is. Uh, most personality psychologists believe in five basic personality traits, one of these traits being agreeableness. And agreeableness involves things like trust, affection, compassion, and men tend to be lower on the agreeableness scale. So. They're more aggressive, competitive, and confrontational, and on the further end of the spectrum, people who are disagreeable tend to always be men. So what he means by toxic masculinity is that he hates it, that I only care about facts, I don't give a fuck about his feelings, and I'm not afraid to confront him on his bullshit. Now, I'm grateful for this information on personality types, but this isn't what I meant by toxic masculinity. Toxic masculinity was coined by Shepard Bliss. He was a pretty big figure in the men's movement back in the 90s. In a men's magazine article from 1996, Bliss describes two male types, the warrior and the farmer. The warrior seeks control. Weapons, other people, territory, the sea, the air, darkness. The farmer is about connecting, communication, relationships in the human and non-human worlds. He proposes that the warrior has been given preference in men over all the other things that men can be. An article in Atlantic Magazine by James Hamblin captures pretty well what I meant when I was talking about toxic masculinity in my video. He describes it as a specific model of manhood geared towards dominance and and control. When men seek that control, when we feel it's our due and don't achieve it, we can resent and hate. Toxic masculinity sets expectations that prime us for disappointment. We turn that disappointment on ourselves and others as anger and hatred. Now, before anybody starts calling me a man hater, look, I dig men, and I'm talking about I dig men, like aggressive men, even that warrior thing, that can be a real turn on. But that's not all I'm looking for in a man. It's not very useful if I'm trying to discuss an issue or work on a project or figure out a solution to a complicated problem, like how to get the world to go vegan or racism or mitigating the effects of capitalism climate change, and I don't necessarily see just being aggressive or being macho as toxic. But let's just say it becomes toxic when the police show up at your house because they think you might actually kill someone. So what happened was I made a video where I was just comparing killing people to killing animals. And I was making the argument where, okay, well, if you just eat meat for you know personal pleasure, then by that same logic, I should just be able to kill people for that same reason, just personal pleasure. Right. And the video, like, obviously, it was dark humor, but it was obviously, like, showing a non-violence method. It's not murder. It's putting you out of your misery. It's not murder. It's extermination. It's not murder. It's blowing your fucking brains out. And then the cops, uh, bro, like just came to my house at three in the morning. Oh, wow. Um, they dragged me out of my house and, uh, the lead investigator was saying, do you think you can just say this shit online and get away with it anymore? Like, and I was like, what are you talking about? And then he said, you said you wanted to kill people who eat meat. And I said, no, I didn't. Did you watch my video? <laughs> it's blowing your fucking brains out. So then I got thrown into a police car. They sent me to a mental hospital where I got uh, psychologically evaluated. Um, after like three hours, uh, the doctor there just allowed me to leave. So if this isn't an example of someone being turned off to your message, I don't know how to make that point any clearer. I'm sure it was at best an annoyance and something that Richard will probably want to avoid in the future. As an American, I would find that situation pretty terrifying and I wouldn't be sure if I was gonna make it out alive. So Richard, I'm sorry you went through that, but I think it makes my point.
I don't know, what do you think? Outside of your little social justice warrior echo chamber, there are people with functioning testicles and functioning brains who perceive jokes as jokes and they don't want to listen to your emotional pandering bullshit. So I'll be back later in the week with a video about Black Lives Matter and why they aren't about black supremacy. Even if they do get angry at white people sometimes. That's it for this video. Like it if you like it. Share, comment, subscribe. This is Reg signing off. Love yourself. Peace. And I love myself.